Hey everyone, hope you're doing well. My name is Keshev and I'm the editor of this episode. This episode is with Erin Marshall, who's a PhD and CPA based out of Edmonton. She started her career with KPMG in British Columbia, working her way up to manager and eventually leaving and deciding that she wanted to do her PhD. Uh, she started her PhD um, at Berkeley in California and eventually switching to finish at uh, the University of Alberta in, in Edmonton. And she joins Sam to discuss how when to know it's the right time to make a change in your career and and leave a job for something that you feel you are always meant to do. I think you're really gonna like this episode. There's a lot of value in it, especially for uh, people who are doing their undergrad right now and entering um, in co-op, looking for a full-time position post-grad. Uh, I think there's a lot of value for people like that in this episode. So without further ado, here's the episode and enjoy. Good morning, good afternoon, Aaron Marshall. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I know I have my teacher voice on now. <laughs> we are live. So thank you so, so much for agreeing to be here. Uh, so before we get into who you are, um, I want to share with the audience, like, how do we know each other? Do we know each other? <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you for agreeing to be here. <laughs> how do we know each other? Yeah. <laughs> So I guess like we go back to Calgary, right? And in and, and our involvement with uh, CPA Western School of Business, I was in Calgary, had recently moved there for a job and I decided that it was a good idea to get more involved with the CPA profession. I kind of had finished my PhD and wanted to get more involved in what was going on in education. So I went to a training at, I don't even remember what hotel, maybe some Hilton downtown or something. And yeah. Sam was there doing the leadership and the presenting and, and we kind of touched base after that. Yes. And we've kept in touch ever since. Yeah, we did keep in touch. And it's funny because we, like, I'm sure you're, you're very similar. Like, we meet a lot of people and we interact um, with a lot of people with perhaps same or similar backgrounds. Um, but yeah, I felt like when we met, it just clicked. And I think we swapped emails or something. And then, yeah, we just happened to find a way to keep in touch um, and just organically through our shared passion and involvement with accounting education being in Calgary. Uh, I think we're both fun. We're, I, I don't know if fun people can say they're fun, but we're fun. And uh, it's all, it was always nice to like get shit done and be able to have some laughs along the way. And really, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, that's how it started. And that was a few years ago. And since then, um, you are now in Edmonton and I am now in Halifax. So you, before we get into what the heck you're doing at Edmonton, <laughs> let's hear about your story because just for everybody listening, you have, you mentioned you have a PhD and you mentioned that we know each other from CPA or at the time, I guess, maybe in CPA or CA um, education. So you're a CPA, CA with a PhD in accounting. Amazing. Uh, amazing. And yeah, so which, which one came first and how did it all start? So bring us back to, to the beginning-ish. Sure. So... I guess framing this, I did never had a plan to go into accounting. It was never my plan. So my original plan was I went to the University of Victoria and I went for a degree in international business. And I thought, okay, my goal out of this is to be some form of international lawyer working in Europe or wherever. And part of the UVic undergrad was to get a co-op position. So I was like, okay, I have to do a co-op. I did my first one with like a hydro company, pretty unrelated to anything I wanted to do. Then I did one with a lawyer and decided, okay, this is 1000% not for me um, for various reasons. <laughs> and then my last one, I had no co-op job. And so I thought, okay, who can I reach out to? My cousin happened to work for KPMG. And so I thought, sure, help me out. You guys probably need help. I know it's busy season, tax time, whatever. So they said, sure, come be basically our tax pool coordinator and also do some maybe a few reviews, audits, NTRs on the side. So I thought, okay. So I went there, really, really thought, this is great. Look what I get to learn. I got to go to all these companies. What I loved most about being the coordinator for tax pool is getting to know pretty much every single person in the whole firm, from the partners to the admin staff to all of the workers. And I love that about it, all the touch points. And then basically I said, hey, do you guys have a full-time position? Sure. So then after that, I didn't have any accounting courses, so I had to take them through Athabasca. I had to take them through Camosun College. So while I was finishing my degree, I decided to do the accounting on the side. 
and then never left. Well, that's not true. I never left. I did leave. <laughs> I stayed for five years and I really liked it. I stayed for manager. I went and worked in the U.S. for a while, um, down in the south of the U.S. and in the north for about a year and a half and worked on a variety of companies, everything from like small NPO, St. John's Ambulance, all the way up to General Electric as a consolidated company. So saw the huge spectrum. That's and I really loved it. Yeah, that's so fascinating. No, and I like the, the range of clients because sometimes people might think, hey, you're a KPMG, it's a big company. That means I'm going to get stuck or have the privilege of focusing on one client for 11 months out of the year, you know, work on their tested controls and kind of, you know, just, just never leave this one client, this one team. Um, and yet it's been my experience and I'm really happy to hear your experience that that isn't the case and that there are travel opportunities. There's small not-for-profits, there's large public companies uh, that are probably um, going in either IFRS, US GAAP, sometimes both and having to figure out and coordinate all of that with an international team. So fan fantastic. Now, okay. Do you have any good inventory count stories? I'm just, I'm always so yeah, curious. When I mean good, I mean like bad. Like tell, <laughs> tell me the time when you had to stay up all night um, counting like slaughterhouse pigs or something. True story, <laughs> not mine. Okay. No, we had a slaughterhouse at our office. I never had to do it. I got asked, but I am vegetarian. So I did not have to do it. I had an out, but we did have that one kind of some random ones I did I had to go on a flight and do a, do like a controls observation on a flight which was kind of you'd think it would be enjoyable but basically I flew to Toronto got back and flew back <laughs> so I was like okay fine it was really you bad the cockpit, or was it like um... no like I was oh! in a regular seat testing how they did their regular like food service and stuff like that really bad flight, horrible weather. So ended up being a horrible experience in that sense. Another one I went to was just like normal. They held like plastic parts, actually. They manufactured like price tags, price tag holders. We were told we were allowed to wear like Lululemon, whatever. It's kind of a dirty warehouse. We got there. The CEO ended up being there. was super annoyed with us for not wearing a suit. So I learned my lesson there. Another one I had to count logs. Hold on. Hold on. I just want to say, <laughs> learned your lesson. When you say that, what do you mean? Well, like you always just go over deliver, I guess. Yes. Like you can have your Lululemon in your backpack, but yes. start with the suit and go backwards. Like Absolutely. learn that you can't really go up from the bottom. So it's much easier to be embarrassed for being overdressed than looking like you're going to the gym. No, I, and I wanted to point that out because, you know, we've had it where I've seen people, you know, show up for interviews and at like, you know, industry in jeans. And then they look around like, oh shoot, so should I be wearing like uh, like a suit? And it just, it's those things that communicate kind of the, the broader edge and should it matter if you're in Lulu's or in a suit? And the answer is no, but you know, does it matter? And impressions matter. Um, we're in professional services. We're delivering professional, you know, services. So yeah, you can always, go to the bathroom, switch into your Lulu's. And so that's one of those things though, that isn't going to be in a course. It's not going to be in, uh, in a handbook. So I'm glad that it organically came up here. Cause it's like, now, you know, now, like, and I'm sure you've been to interviews or items when you are like decked out and you're like, well, this, whatever. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like whatever exactly at least I know that I'm safe how I am you can look at me for wearing my overdressed whatever but at the end of the day it's okay it's like a comfort zone and yes, I always, now you're I comfortable even... in your mind you can proceed how you want to proceed yes. so it's like you taking your control and your power and owning it and not having to think about everything else yeah exactly like what is my comfort zone? And that's where you kind of yeah. want to go. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. But inventory counts weren't, they weren't too much the bane of my existence, but I did some in like pouring rain, counting cars outside, counting car parts in the absolute torrential downpour. Then again, in a suit with no umbrella, with a clipboard <laughs> over my head and you just give up, right? We're probably in a commercial absolutely. somewhere. That's very like, <laughs> yeah, CA gets it done. <laughs> Absolutely. But I remember it, and the most is like, I did my first one and no one told me how to do it. So I always like after that, learn to be the senior that's going to train and going to help and going to show you how to do it. Cause I think it's so nerve wracking to be like alone doing something for the first time. Absolutely. Uh, and that leads like, you know, skipping ahead and then we'll circle back, but to education is like just having that empathy 
that, you know, if we know something, there was a point in time where we didn't know that. And in order to go from what we don't know to where we want to know something and want to be proficient, there is that vulnerability of the growth. So, you know, just remembering and being empathetic and walking with somebody and inviting questions. So, so, so important. And being the senior that you wish, you know, would have been there every single time versus, well, this is what was done to me. So therefore yeah. you can, yeah. you can figure it out. Like it's just an inventory count. Just go count things. <laughs> so. Well, absolutely. And Sam, you bring up a good point. Cause that was said to me a few times during my career. Well, this is how it was done when I was there. So you need to pay your dues. And I was like, okay, I, I sort of get that rhetoric or whatever you want to call it. But like, at the same time, how did you feel when that was happening to you? Do you want me to feel the same or do you genuinely want to grow and help the, the organization grow? And I always thought, oh, it's better to grow. Who cares if I had to go through it? I don't want someone else to. No, and if anything, then I'm sure we kind of took on the narrative. Like I went through this so that you don't have to. And we can go yeah. for new challenges and like stuff will still be hard and we'll grow together and we'll find new challenges and we'll get through it. And yeah, we'll grow the pie, build the pie and um, then be all better off for it versus this like kind of zero sum <laughs> i've done this to you i've done this to you <laughs> like, no okay so you stayed five years you made made it to manager and wait a minute you're not supposed to leave what what happened what like where did you go like <laughs> <laughs> as an aside, as an aside yeah. I do know one person that won't be on this um, episode or on, on the series, but he went for a wedding in Mexico and he never came back and that's how he left. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think it's really important. These details are important. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, did, I didn't ghost my firm. So no, I, I like, I'm like, like I said at the beginning, I never wanted to be an accountant. I more fell into it. And I fell in love with it. I fell in love with it as like a language, as a way to communicate in a business sense. So once I was in it, I was like, no, I should really learn from this and really try to grow. And like one of my top personal things that I always strive for, one of my top values is growth. And, and I thought, like, wow, like you're, you're really letting 23 year old me talk to the CEO of General Electric. Okay, sure. I'm going to grab that because wherever else I go, I'm going to start really, really low. But, but I always knew I wanted to do my PhD. It was always there. I had a goal from way back when I was like 17, like this is something I want to do. And it was just about finding the right time. And I found like, Eventually, I was getting up and thinking about that more than I was my job. And I was like, no, nah, I'm thinking about that way more. Like, what could I do instead of what am I doing? And I'm rushing through my days so I can do something else instead of really enjoying my life, living in the moment, understanding my client. It was like, when am I done this client? When can I be done? And I felt this extremely strong sense of being done. And, and it wasn't like I hated my job or wanted out. I just wasn't vibing with the people as much anymore because I wasn't as embedded in it and, and really committed so I was like no I'm gonna go back it was not like a huge traumatic story or anything just like this is what I was ready yeah yeah so like listening to yourself and you were likely yeah. you know correct me if I'm wrong but doing same or similar things um that you had done in the past or you know maybe same or similar growth potentials but at some point it just wasn't lighting you up inside and we start listening to that and start being aware just asking yourself okay like this isn't necessarily where I want to be what next and having yeah. that inkling um, or having that original drive and then revisiting and saying, hey, what about this? And then ask, you know, and then I'm sure you felt a little bit more excited and you're like, oh, okay, yeah. well, this is what's exciting me. This is not no longer. So you feel that pull. So then what did you do? How did you, how did like, what, what, I don't even know, like, what does the application process look like? What kind of timeline? Did you find your supervisor first in your school? Did you know what part of accounting you wanted to study? Like, tell me about the, the transition of, you know, firm to uh, academia as a student. And how old were you at the time, if you don't mind me asking? I was, how old was I? 27. I was 27. Yeah. So no, 26. Sorry, I was 26. So at the time I thought, okay, I'm going to start researching. So my first point was like, read and read and read these, these um, universities websites. And what I knew about PhD and from what I got from the website is that you really had to understand the professors that were already at a school. Who's there? What are they doing? How do you fit in with the school? Because it's not just like an undergrad or a master's where there's huge pool of students and you just go do it. It's like you really need to fit with the school and they really need to fit with you and it needs to be a match because you're doing research 
you don't just do your own research, you really try to do it the same as someone there. So I read and read professor bios. I also thought about geography, like where do I want to be? And so that, that was my main limiting factor. I wasn't like, let's go anywhere in the universe, anywhere in Canada or the US. It was like really limiting as to where I wanted to live. So I picked a few places on the West Coast and I picked a few places that I really liked on the East Coast. And I applied to five schools and um, I don't know, the application process is a bit daunting because you have to write a big essay. It needs to match with the school. It has to be different for each school and you have to write the GMAT. So I just really committed to that. I was like, I have to put an unusual effort in because I don't want to not get in and kind of not be stuck at KPMG, but not be able to leave. It was okay. It took me about, I would say the three months for the application process. It's a good three months. It's investment. It's and studying. so you're, because at this time throughout KPMG, you would have um, done, did you do the PEP modules or did you do like an impact program? No, I did CASB. Yeah. So we both yeah. did CASB. So you did CASB, um, article to KPMG so very demanding right um so mm, yeah. wrote and passed the UV yeah. and then you know after five years felt that pull and then had to you know quote go back to school again and buckle down and invest three months out of your life and that was evenings weekends yeah. um what's oh, yeah. left of your evenings what's left of your weekends and you know you just made it work yeah. Yeah. It was like December, January, February, I want to say, or even like farther wow. November. Yeah. And so it was just a real time. I met, I can see myself coming back from work, sitting at this desk I had in my apartment at the time and just going to town studying for that GMAX and knew you had to get a certain score and whatever measure it is, you just have to do it. You can't fight it. Right. You just have to do it. Yeah. So yeah. And you have a goal end. and you have these like pathways and, uh, acceptance and you know surrender I'm like okay hey, like and then work hard yeah. <laughs> but there's one thing I did want to share like when I when I got so I applied to some like I guess you would call them prestigious schools and mostly because why wouldn't you want to go to like a prestigious school and and I and I got in and so I went started my PhD at Berkeley in California and thought I have to do it even though when I went there for the interview I knew it was not a good fit I knew in my mm. gut this is not good for me and I had gone uh, to U of A and felt like wow the students are really happy here the profs are happy I like that it uses my Canadian CPA knowledge or CA knowledge at the time and it's really positive whereas Berkeley was like every student was like seven years they didn't feel happy there but I thought I would regret not accepting this this is stupid in, in, in my words at the time and I went there in July of, uh, and started and the first class they put me in was an economics class economics 701 the highest econ I had was econ 350 and I thought oh sure skipping four years of econ will be fine <laughs> mathematical proof course prove f equals two I was like I don't I can't start like I can't even start why did you not tell me that this wasn't going to be a fit in the sense you saw my CV, you saw my background, etc. So I struggled through it for about a month and then really identified that no, I'm, I'm out of here. And I went back to Alberta and, and picked what I believe to be my top match. So I would say like students struggling like with things like, oh, you have to go to a big four or, and, or it's meaningless or you have to do this or it's not good enough. Your have tos and your shoulds should only be what matches in your gut. And you know, those things like, it's, and it was a big lesson for me. Absolutely. Uh, wow. Um, and then so, so relatable, right? Uh, oh. Even now, what do we hear? Oh, you should go to a firm. You should make it to manager. Then you should go to industry yeah. and you should do this and you should do that. And it's like, no, like you should do what lights you up inside. And then when that changes, change. And if it doesn't change, cool. You found your shit really early on. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. That's a good problem. Um, but, you know, trust that feeling inside. And when you feel scared, they say that excitement and nerves are on the same, like, energy wave. So embrace it. Like that, if you're afraid, um, it, you know, if you're like, oh, I, I kind of want to do this, but I'm afraid, that means you give it, like, give a hoot, right? And you should let yeah. you lean into that. So, I agree. I agree. I agree. I always tell my students, if your first job, and this is a quote I heard, if your first job doesn't scare you, you haven't reached high mm. enough. So like reach higher, right? Oh, similar, like, um, perfect. That's fantastic. Similar to the, if you're the smartest person in the room, you might be in the wrong <laughs> <Yeah>. room. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, like, if you constantly find yourself like, <laughs> I'm the expert, uh, chances are, A, maybe you're, you're not and you just don't you're have self awareness, or you are constantly in the same room, right? Um, and even like when, and we'll get to kind of where you are now, but even when we teach, our students, and our candidates are so rich with knowledge that it's not like we are the ultimate holder of knowledge, like uh, with adult learning and higher education, it's a lot about collaboration and we can learn and grow just, you know, alongside with them. So. Absolutely. Um, hey, I'm curious with the details, if you don't mind sharing, how do you, so you're in, you're in California at, um, right? Berkeley? Yeah, at okay. Berkeley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and you're like, you realize you have your aha moment. How do yeah. you then, how do you physically, like, who do you email? What do you do? And how long does it take you to kind of yeah. go, go find your place? Actually, that's a good question. Cause this was, um, it sounds over overselling it, but this is a turning point in my life personally. Like at the time I was saying to my boyfriend, now husband, like, I can't do this. I, I can't stay up all night studying math. This isn't what I got into this for. I'm passionate about like the psych portion of accounting. I, why am I doing this to myself? And he said, why don't you just email U of A and say, this is where I'm at. Will you take me back? And I was like, really? Whoa, that's a huge, like, you're putting your ego completely aside and saying, I made a mistake. I'm basically groveling back to you. Please take me. And you're setting yourself up for a huge, like, no. And then the feeling of that is like, what did I do? And so I thought, okay, can I accept all that? Sure. No problem. So I did it. And my supervisor, Kareem Jamal responded. I don't know. I think it was within the hour. Yes. We'll take you back. <laughs> so told Berkeley I'm out. I booked my flight. My mom came down to spend like a couple last days in California. She's like, you're leaving. We didn't even get to have fun. <laughs> and then I went- three years in California in three days. <laughs> no, I have to get out of this rental contract. It's $3,000 a month. I need to leave. And so then, yeah, left, went back and started that in September. Had to move then to Alberta. Yeah, it was um, a little bit hard on the pocketbook, but definitely worth it. Yeah. And it told me like taking a chance, like really just swallowing your pride and saying like, this is what I want. And your reaction to it is not a potential reaction is not going to dictate like my life react how you want, but this is what I want. And it worked out. <laughs> you bet on yourself and it was contagious. Yeah, yeah exactly. Wow. All right. So that, um, that brings us possibly to where are you at now? So, um, so you finish your a PhD and what field are you in? Just what, what area of accounting? So mine was, um, accounting with a psych minor. So you gen if you want to do your PhD, you generally choose like math, um, and you do modeling. So you'd model like behavior of stock markets or behavior of information and how people use it. Uh, or you would do econ and look more like at um, econometrics and big data. Or you do psych and look at how people use accounting information. So that was more mine and how people use it, how people make decisions, how they view an independent auditor versus an expert auditor, that sort of thing. And that took, that's why I wanted to work at U of A because the people there were doing that sort of stuff. Fantastic. So you defend and you are then a triple threat, uh, PhD, CPA, CA, <laughs> and my words, not yours. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, you started um, from, I think when we met up, you would have been yeah. teaching in academia and yeah. um, teaching in the accounting profession. And then some, somewhere um, you went out and you are, you know, I, again, my words, like you are an educator that I love collaborating with. I love our talks. I love, you know, reconnecting and bouncing ideas off with you. And you are now, um, so you went and taught around the province, I believe, and you are now back at U of A um, as not only faculty, but you are also the director of the Masters of Accounting program. Yeah, like, so yeah, I graduated and took a job in Calgary as an academic, a tenure track research faculty, and it just wasn't like resonating with me. And I think when I like reconnected with Sam or really met Sam, it was me reaching out for something different. Like, let's go connect with the profession. And, and I thought like, like it took me seven years at one point uh, along the line to publish a paper. And I thought, can I do this forever? What, there's gotta be something else. Like, why did I get into this originally? And it really was about 
growth from an educational perspective, growth from an accounting education perspective, and how can I achieve that? And a position happened to open up after while I was in Calgary back at U of A for a position about our running our master's of accounting program that was just starting up at the time. So 2017 and 16, maybe I'm not sure. So anyway, um, yeah, I grabbed that. And, and one of the things it did involve was putting research aside and saying like, I'm going to be more of an administrator and educator instead of a research academic. And that was a really good fit. And I think that's another example of like, just because you have a PhD doesn't mean you have to do exactly what other PhDs do. There are other spots for you. It's more rare to be totally transparent, but it is possible to have these roles. So, you know, coming back to that decision, um, are you, because sometimes our students want to say like, you know, what are the tactics? Did you use pro con list? Do you, you know, write, run an email and then save it as drafts? Or like, what are the tactics that you do to kind of get that gut check to say, hey, this is what I want to do. This is where it's pulling me shoot, like these are some pretty big significant changes from firm to PhD to, you know, landing what many people would consider like, like, what is it something like 2% or 5% of PhDs land a tenure track role in their field in research, like in to research. So how do you make these significant changes um, and do it for the quote, right reasons, and then, you know, trust yourself forward, what's the decision making. And, And then the important thing is, is afterwards being there, you know, owning it and having no regrets, right? Because I don't hear a single regret out of your mouth uh, for any of these paths. So yeah, maybe start with some tactics. This is a good question, Sam. So Sam is so good at asking questions. So (laughs) number one about regrets, like, I think so much of life is how you frame your past. Like you're going to have shitty things happen to you. Absolutely. (laughs) Everybody is. But it's like, you can be the person that looks at that event and, and, goes in goes in a direction and feels sorry for themselves and says like well this happened to me so that means I can't do this or because this happened to me I react like this to situations but I've always felt that's extremely harmful and like I always feel like no I don't regret anything because it put me where I am today I can only use it in a powerful way to say whoa maybe that decision was a bad one but whoa I learned a lot I learned I don't like math I learned I really like having a supervisor who behaves this way and instead of using it as something that brings me down it just allows me to go in a different direction so about regrets no no regrets it's all learning right second like I think it's about what is your life blueprint? Where do you, and it isn't the standard question, like write down where you see yourself in 10 years, because that's painful. It's like, you want to think about it, but what's your blueprint for getting there? Is it through academia generally? Is it having a life where, you know, you can go on a run every day at five o'clock? Like what empowers you daily and how does your life blueprint fit that? And then taking a step back and looking at your current life conditions and whether those are allowing you to live your your blueprint and so for me it was about like the conditions of having to do research weren't meeting my blueprint of having a family of really enjoying traveling it was occupying like 80 percent of my mind and really only giving me 20 percent of my satisfaction so i need i knew i needed to change my life conditions which was definitely changing the type of job i had and like what i did and 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 i I was happy to do that. It really changed because uh, one of the reasons I went into academia for, was for being autonomous and I didn't feel that with research, but I feel it more with education. So you are the only person at U of A with your role. Oftentimes when I hear students say things, they say, well, I should do A then B because there's so many jobs here. And yeah. sometimes I let them talk and then I just say, how many jobs do you want? <laughs> <laughs> And oftentimes it's like, well, one, sometimes none, maybe two. Uh, And I'm like, yeah, so then go for it. So rather than playing the numbers game, uh, build up your skill set, be a decent human and get out there and try. Because the worst, if you go for something and you don't get it, you are likely in the same spot, if not better off, because you don't know who you might meet. Or I don't know about you, but um, I often haven't been somebody's first choice but I've been their last choice and I've been the choice that they've come back to time and time again. And that's where I feel like my strength and I'm never like better. I'm never like, well, you should have got me first. Like, I don't, you know, just like you, I'm like, yeah, it hurt my feelings, but if this is something I want, I'll check my ego and then go for it. And I will deliver and I will make you forget who the first choice was ever. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, over deliver, right? I think that's a critical thing for any student or any third or fourth year students. You always want to over deliver. It's, it's very easy to just meet the standard. But I think, yeah, Sam is someone who I know to always over deliver and always like come up with something new. And I certainly believe that about myself as well. It's like, what's the standard? Where can, how, how can you take that further? And it's about creating habits, like creating mm -hmm. habits, even as an undergrad, what habits are you creating for yourself? Are they healthy? Are you someone who waits till the last minute? Because once you get in real life, if that's that job you want, are you going to apply it the last minute? That's bad. So if you can create those habits now in undergrad, where you have this beautiful flexibility and this beautiful certainty, it's really, really, really helpful. And I think with jobs, like flex your courage muscles, right? We all have them. Be courageous. Step out of the zone. The worst someone can say is no. That's the worst. Like the worst that can happen. Yes. So it's always like just be courageous and you'll 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 be amazed at what can come to you. And last thing Sam said, you'll be amazed at who you meet. So even if that first opportunity doesn't work out. You never know like what, where that will lead you down the road, even if it seems trivial. You as students probably get invited to a million like seminars or this, go, just go. You might get one thing out of it. Just go to everything, experience everything, do it. And don't say you don't have any time. That's a resource constraint. Be re more resourceful than that. You have yes. time. <laughs> yes, yes. And we know it's demanding. We know it's demanding to be students. We, yes. It doesn't get any easier. Um, so you make time for what matters, right? And, and get after it. Yes. Perfect. Yes. So as we kind of wrap this up, uh, I'm curious, and I ask all of my guests this, this is one of those questions where I started off asking my students, uh, my fourth year students at the back of bonus questions. And I'm just so, so curious. Erin, oh, no. what is your definition of success? <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Uh, geez, uh, I know you, you even like showed me this question before and I was like, yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> what is your definition? I, I, well, I feel like it changes, right? Yes. Like, it's like, this is my definition of success right now. And I feel like 20 minutes from now, it could be different, but, but for me, like success, and this will sound cheesy, but I'll give you more. It, it, it is balance, but I don't believe balance is achieved every day. Like, Balance is maybe I have two years of doing a CPA where I work my butt off for that only and I have no life and my friends are like, where'd you go? And that's fine. But eventually that balance comes back. From what I see my students struggle with today, they expect that balance every day. Every day, perfectly balanced life is the only way to leave a, lead a balanced life. And I just don't subscribe to that because then you'll never do anything that really requires effort. So to me, success means always doing my best, always taking a chance, being somewhere where I can grow. There's like six human needs, right? What are they? Certainty, variety, love and connection, growth, contribution, and significance. For me, it's love and connection and growth. And success to me means having love and connection with my family. I'm a mother. And being in a job where I can grow. And if at any time those are not mad, I think that would be my definition of not successful. But I don't think money, I don't think a certain position is my definition of success. It's more about personal growth and personal satisfaction. Okay. And like one last thing I wanted yeah. to say to the student, this always resonates with my students, is that you guys will underestimate the effort it takes. I will tell you to do some of the things I've done, it required a psychologically unreasonable effort. Yeah. Unreasonable. Yeah. <laughs> and it almost killed me, but just be prepared to put in the effort. And knowing that you are working within your blueprint towards your goals, towards things that are for your growth, for your reasons, not because you saw it on Instagram, not because you can tweet about it later, but because it's something that lights you up. It's about for, you know, when I think about it versus time management, it's energy management. Am I, am I filling my cup or do I get excited? Do I want to do this? Am I rushing home after a 12 hour day to sit down at my desk and, and read and research and just getting those gut checks. And when you live your truth, um, you know, I have some strong intuition and that's when you are living your definition of success is when you're not even considering what is success. You are just in yeah. it, living your truth. And it's a happy, a happy byproduct. No, totally. that's, that's super fantastic. Um, and I will say uh, just further, I 
love, love speaking with you and talking with you. And it's, you. you know, when you get thank you to like our, our physicians, um, it's so nice to do things. Um, and I think people should do this throughout, um, do things because they want to, not because there's any certain end goal or outcome, or I do this for you, or you do this for me, but it's like, Hey, let's just get together. Let's talk and let's see what happens. And, um, sometimes some really, really cool things happen. And it's about, you know, getting out there, meeting people, finding your people and, yes. um, quality over quantity. Right. So yes, yes absolutely. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, Aaron and I don't have like a standing, I don't know, every three weeks from three o'clock to 3.33. This is uh, Aaron and Sam time. And we will talk about this, that, and the other thing. Nah, sometimes <laughs> it's just um, but a cool thing that we want to do in our classrooms or, you know, something with a profession or something in academia. And it's just nice to, to find your people and find your people and, um, and be generous with your time and they'll be generous with, um, with their time as well. So thank you for coming on here and Thanks being generous me. with us, with your time. Of course, anytime. Okay, bye Erin. See ya. <laughs>